2014, the Irish tourist industry launched a new initiative where they packaged and branded the coastal experience. The Wild Atlantic Way. It cost 10 million euros to develop, and they recently secured 100 million euros to bring it to the next level. A lot of capital funding. Currently, it's bringing 1.3 million visitors to the country. And this is all very exciting, and the economists are happy. But I think we need to think about, do we have the capacity, do rural coastal communities have the capacity, do coastal ecosystems, which are fragile and sensitive, do they have the capacity to handle this number of visitors? Specifically, I want to focus in on one part of the coastal system, which is what I believe one of the most neglected, underused, not underused, undervalued natural resources we have, and that's sand dunes. They are an integral part of our natural heritage. They have huge scientific and recreational value, and essentially a lot of the activities on the coastline occur on sand dunes, but they're under severe pressure in Ireland. And this is coming from two sources. Because of our, our location, and I don't have to tell people from Galway this, because of our location in Northwest Europe, we're on the edge, we get a lot of Atlantic storms. And these can cause not only episodic, but they can also cause chronic sand erosion and chronic dune erosion. One of the issues we have is, if climate change projections are to be believed, the story is pretty bleak. Storms are going to get more intense. They're going to get more intense on a rising sea level, which is going to have more wave run-up and more potential for dune erosion. By association, there's more risk of coastal inundation from storm surge. And that's from the ocean side. Coastal dune ecosystems, and in general, all our coastal ecosystems are also being squeezed from the landward side. And this comes from things like development, things like tourism and human activities. And these can have a massive impact on the quality and health of these systems. Coastal communities depend on these systems. They're the bloodline for their survival. And it's our job to protect them. Currently in Ireland, we've had a legacy of really poor management of our coastline. And that's very unfortunate. I'm hoping this will change the next couple of years. But I think many of you who visit the coast will agree with me that Basic amenities, basic facilities just don't occur on our coastlines. Designated parking, legal camping for tents or for RVs, toilets, dumping facilities, access points to the coast, they simply don't occur. There's no local plans being enforced either, there's no management plans, so the cumulative effects are that our coastal systems are being degraded. They're breaking down quickly from visitors who have no control, there's no control over where they go and how they behave. And I, I truly do believe that we're getting to a point in time where landowners are actually going to cut off access to the coast across their land. And it's their right to do so because landowners on the coast depend on these systems to protect themselves. So what's the solutions? Well, I'm going to offer two tonight. Uh, the first is, I believe, we need to monetize these coastal ecosystems. And unfortunately, this is a very capitalist approach. But ultimately, the bean counters want to get value for money. What's the return on investment if we invest in the coastline? And I believe we need to do this for a couple of reasons. Ireland 2040 last year was a big, a big milestone in rural Ireland when Leo Varadkar, Taoiseach Leo Varadkar said, we've earmarked 1 billion euros for rural communities. And this is through the Rural Redevelopment and uh, the Rural Regeneration and Development Fund. And I'm not quite sure, and no one is quite sure how this money is going to be split up. And actually, I'm, I part of me believes it could be kind of a dragon's den. So I want coastal communities and coastal managers to be in a position where they can actually show these decision makers how much these systems are worth. Now, this begs the question, what are, how do you put a value on a system like this? Um, what are the benefits of the system? Well, to do this, we can look at our colleagues over in the UK, because this has not been done in Ireland before. 
and it's having an impact on the amount of money being put into the coastal systems in Ireland. Colleagues in the UK have actually done a, a large study on all the benefits that sand dunes offer, and you can see them all listed up here. Some of them you probably don't, wouldn't have thought of. And they use international best practices. This is based on a UN-sponsored uh, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which is like a roadmap to identify and map the condition and trends of ecosystem services and also uh, put a value on them. We need to do this in order to get a hand in the pie. A study in the UK was done uh, looking at ecosystem services provided by coastal margins. And what they included was not just dunes, they also included things like salt marshes, shingle, mac hair, and lagoons. And the number they came up with was 48 billion pounds. I did a really crude study analysis on this a couple of weeks ago, which is I used their methodology, which is based on 3.41% of gross national income. And I came up with a number for Ireland, which is 2.4 billion. Now, this is absolutely a figure that we have to take with a grain of salt, but what I wanted to show was the potential. This is actually the potential value of what our ecosystem services are worth. So that by reciprocation, it's time for the government to stand up and help us protect and conserve these. The second solution is conceptually very straightforward, but a lot more difficult to implement, and this is local solutions for local problems for coastal management. And what does this do? This prioritizes coastal communities and coastal management. This is kind of a shift away from previous approaches, which were more policy-led, and then policy-led was replaced with, it was science-led. And ultimately, both of those failed to make an impact on the ground. Now, to see how this actually plays out on the ground, I'm going to present to you a case study of a place I'm working, of a community I'm working with in County Kerry, in the Maharese. I picked the Maharese because it has a phenomenally well-developed beach dune system that has little impact from development on the dunes. Secondly, my father's from there, so I spent all the summers here, which I find it ironic now that all the sand dunes that I see run up and down on and destroy, are, I'm now trying to protect. The Maharese Peninsula is a tambolo, a very low-lying tambolo that separates Brandon Bay on the west and Tralee Bay on the east. Importantly, it's also within a, a larger special area of conservation. And it's a special area of conservation because it's, do, it's a, a large dune system that have very unique habitats and species, most famously the natter jack toad. It's undergone a tremendous social change the last couple of decades. And this is not unlike other places I've visited in Ireland or worked in Ireland or just familiar with in Ireland, which is a transition from farming and fishing, primary modes of production. They've, more recently, that has been going into tertiary goods and services, which is tourism and visitors. This has had a, a massive impact on the ground. Essentially, what we've seen in this area in the last couple of decades is a shift from land to sea. The economy now revolves around the sea and all the recreational uh, opportunities that are offered down there. You would think that this title of, like, it is a, a water mecca would be a good thing, but it, it comes with a it's kind of a pyrrhic victory for them, which I'll explain. So I arrived down there thinking I'd be looking at beach and dunes eroding in the wintertime, recovering in the summertime, because that's what the coastal systems do normally. But we quickly figured out that wasn't the case. Visually here you'll see in the top left uh, a drainage block that was put in to, to basically the, t the intersection of the road above the dune there was getting flooded, so they put in a drainage ditch. It was installed in 1978, and when it was installed, the front of that drainage came out the front of the dune. Now, the bottom right, you can see today that that dune face has retreated 30 meters. And we've, we've, we've done the studies on this, and we've seen that these rates are now getting faster and faster every year, over a meter a year. On the top right there, it's an example of one of the letters I received from a, a local living on the sand dunes. He gave me a bunch of letters that they had given to local authorities and their public representatives for years, years, but they got no, no voice. No money was ever invested to actually protect them, even though 
it was clear to everyone that they were suffering massive erosion. Nearly three years ago to the day, yesterday in fact, 6th of February 2016, I gave a public talk down there in preliminary results in Castle Gregory with my colleague. And a couple of things came out of that. It was a packed house and every politician in the area was there. And that's because the election was actually two weeks away. I think they only found one poll to advertise my talk. The rest of them were taken. At that meeting, the locals stood up and one by one, they expressed real frustration at the National Parks Wildlife Service because they felt they were preventing them from doing any mitigation on coastal erosion. And that's because it was a special area of conservation. But one of the things I did give the community at the end of this presentation, my last slide is up there, I gave them some of my recommendations and a roadmap of what they could possibly do to start mitigating against coastal erosion, which was actually impacting the health and safety of the community. The final recommendation I had was essentially start gathering the data to get a coastal erosion management plan done through OPW. Any work in Ireland and any infrastructural work and any protection or mitigation measures that happen on the coast have to go through OPW. And that was, that's kind of the, the end goal, which I thought would take them years and years. That evening, they, formed, they officially formed the Maharees Conservation Association. And they took off, they mobilized like no other community I've ever seen. First of all, they started focusing on the issues of erosion. So they started building walkways, building fences to keep people off the dunes. And they could only focus on the landward stuff. They don't have the power to stop storms, so they focus on all the impacts of humans. They did dune planting. They linked up with all the important stakeholders in Ireland, on Tashka, the Heritage Council, the local authority. But very importantly, the bottom left, they built dune fencing as well. National Park Wildlands Service approved this. We got them down on the dunes and we told them, here's the scenario. If you don't allow us to do any mitigation here, the very dunes that you're protecting are, are actually be gone. We have found the National MPWS to be incredibly supportive. They're now one of the key partners within the association. As of December 2018, I can track 200 activities they've done. I want to focus on three very quickly to show you the breadth and depth of what this association has done, how they've reshaped their whole landscape and they've reshaped their community. It's absolutely inspiring. Bottom left, last September they unveiled this plaque which commemorates families that left in the 1940s to 1960s up the country in the land migration scheme. They had that weekend, they had mass day music, and they had a celebration of that heritage. Interesting enough, there's a, a real conflict in the area with place names. The water community, the, the surfers, have very different names to the old names. Dumps, mossies, shitties. Now you can imagine some of the local people didn't feel too enthused about that, and so last summer, they wrote another proposal, and they put up all these new signs embracing the older names. Top of this picture, you see the local secondary school. The transition year students started the Fishies Project. They took plastic from Brandon Bay and made it into key rings that they sold for five euros and gave all that money back to the Maharese Conservation Association to help with coastal management. And finally, if you ever go down to Maharese, you'll suddenly see signs that have up that promote the biodiversity of the area, that promote the heritage and the culture. So has it worked? On the top right there, you'll see some of the doom recovery that's occurred already, and it's fantastic to see. It's, it's one of the key things that has really motivated this community. They've, they see change happening. They also know it takes hard work. And this is a phenomenal feeling that a whole community can go up and change how the, how basically the, how the whole landscape is managed. They've won national awards, Ocean Hero Awards, Community Awards, Pride of Place Awards, but honestly, more importantly, they're still not fixed because they still have the storm. So last March, the Office of Public Works announced 150,000 euros 
for a coastal risk management study in the area. But that comes with two caveats in my, in my world. Just because recommendations will come from this report doesn't mean they're going to get capital funding. So that's first. Second of all, the local community might not like the recommendations from this study. It actually might say do nothing, or it might say retreat because of the SAC status. So we, that's an unknown. My job is to keep supporting them. For a while, I, I was driving a bit of the bus, but now I'm way, way at the back. I'm way at the back. And I just keep in contact with them and for some, some project-specific needs. I want to wrap this up by saying coastal communities can make a difference, but we need to support them with money and funding. Just to give you a broader picture of coastal management, adaptation is one measure, and that's what the long-term sustainable adaptation, where we change our behavior to changing climate. Sounds sensible enough, but there's a whole different spectrum where, end of the spectrum where, no, we can beat nature. I've color-coded these according to my beliefs in which one works. And I want to finish up with one that is closer to home which is the prom after the 2013-14 storms was rebuilt from Black Rock up towards the golf course. And you wonder, is this adaptation or resistance, and which approach works? Resistance is costly, and sometimes it gives you the sense that maybe you're safe, and, and I've got some other choice words about it, especially when it, you have to also think about if you're building a big wall you're also creating an issue where there's coastal squeeze. An intertidal zone, a beach can't move inland in response to storms, so they quickly disappear. And this is a problem that's played out not just in Ireland, but globally. Thank you very much.